This is the Rich Dad Radio Show. The good news and bad news about money. Here's Robert Kiyosaki. Hello, hello, hello. This is Robert Kiyosaki, the Rich Dad Radio Show, the good news and bad news about money. We're going to be talking about Facebook and what it's done to the world here. And since I'm a Technosaurus Rex, I know nothing. I barely use my cell phone. I've had, I've got my uh, CEO and President Shane Conigli on the on the program with me, as well as my wife Kim. And our guest today, a very special guest, is Roger McNamee. He's an investor, venture capitalist, and musician. I like the musician part, right, Shane? Yeah, I definitely love that. And he's a managing director and co-founder of Elevation Partners, but is also one of the founders of. Uh, Facebook with Zuckerberg. So his latest book is well, called... Well, not, not a founder. I was an early advisor to early advisor. Okay, good. from 2006 to 2009. So the company well, was two years old when I got involved. Well, your timing was good. <laughs> anyway, he's the author of Zucked, Z-U-K-E-D, Waking Up to the Facebook ca- Catastrophe. So anyway, we're very happy to have you on board. And then, uh, Shane, anything you want to say because you understand the Facebook phenomenon far more than I do? I think the interesting part of Facebook is is just the power of those types of platforms now and the way that they're used is so much different than what I believe was originally they were originally meant for and certainly anticipated uh, during the during the launch of of Facebook as well as you know now Twitter Instagram snapchat and all the other ones but now you're saying that Facebook is a catastrophe. And that's what we like. That's what our program is about today. Why do you say it's a catastrophe? So here's the deal. For I've been involved in investing in Silicon Valley since 1982, and for the first 50 years of Silicon Valley, the industry made products that were designed to make us more capable to improve our, you know, our lives in many different ways. And in the earliest days, Google and Facebook did that exact thing, but they built business models that were based on a form of advertising that was brand new. And when smartphones came along, they essentially ported all of their technology onto devices that were available all day long. And so the habits of checking Facebook and Google turned into addictions for many, many users. And once people are addicted, they're vulnerable. And the problem here is that neither Facebook nor Google took the steps to protect the people who used their products. And as a result, bad guys came along and used the advertising tools to harm innocent people. And we've seen this across a really wide range of areas affecting children, adults, affecting their mental health, affecting democracy, affecting their ability to make choices without fear, which is the specific version of privacy that I focus on. And and frankly, they've managed to block any kind of competitor that might threaten their position. And as a result, we're stuck in this place where these companies that have been in many ways truly brilliant, they created products that are fun to use, really convenient, in many cases increase our productivity. But at the same time, they have taken that market position, which gave them huge economic power, and now they have massive political power. In every country in which they operate, they are the most important influence on politics. And that political power is not elected. There is no oversight. There is no ability to effectively appeal decisions they make. And so each one of us, our lives are more governed today by the algorithms and the AI of Facebook than, and, and Google than they are by the law. Right. I mean, you know, you sit there, there are all kinds of things that are perfectly legal that Google and Facebook won't let you do. And the problem with that is that because of addiction, because of the ability of third parties to use their advertising tools to manipulate what people think and what they believe, we have our democracy has been threatened. Our economy has been threatened. Our public health has been threatened. And I felt like as somebody who had been involved in the early days, that I had a responsibility to call attention to this. And I initially did this by going to my friends, Mark and Cheryl, uh, back in 2016 and saying, guys, I think there's something really wrong here. And that was not something they were excited to hear. They were really polite. And, (laughs) you know, I'd known them for a long time, but they, they basically said, no, no, Roger, nothing to see here. 
Then after the election in 2016, I spent three months trying to persuade them that theirs is a business based on trust. And they may have legal protection for the actions of third parties, but that if the people who use the products decide they're not worthy of trust, the business is going to melt down. And I spent three months trying to convince them of that unsuccessfully. And that's when I became an activist. And I've spent the last um, two years just trying to make sure that people understand what's going on. And I wrote a book in which I tell the story of my discovery. And if you've ever seen the Alfred Hitchcock movie, Rear Window, imagine that I'm Jimmy Stewart. I see something that looks like a crime scene and I pull on a thread trying to discover what it was I'd seen and what the problem was. And I use that narrative to tell you the story of what you need to know. And so, Robert, you'd find this book a no-brainer because I give you the things about technology that you need to know in language that anyone can understand. And I make sure you understand that most of the language they use is designed to fool you, and therefore you can safely ignore it. And I show you how to do that. And then I finish the book by telling you what I hope that policymakers will do to correct the situation, and that what each and every one of us can do, those of us who, who use and love Facebook, who use and love Instagram, use and love YouTube and Google and, and Twitter, that in reality, we have a lot of power. These companies depend on our attention, and we can insist that they change their behavior and stop harming us. So I'm asking this question. Did Mark and Cheryl not care about what you were talking about? I mean, did they just no, not I care? Don't, I, that, it's a great question. I, I can't tell you because they don't talk to me anymore. Really? But <laughs> no, no Christmas no. cards well, this year. You huh? can understand. No, no. <laughs> and and, and here's, here's the thing. that They built that business by doing things that everybody told them would never work. And so they got very used to the notion that their critics were always wrong. So it, there was a reflexive reaction to reject what I was saying. And what, you know, to my mind, I, I, I can easily forgive all of that, that, you know, everybody makes mistakes. What I have more trouble with is the way they behave since the evidence came out that documents conclusively that they, you know, that, that their actions have harmed people. Just in the... Just recently, we've had a couple examples on Facebook where uh, they had games on Facebook which were set up in such a way that little kids ran up $1,000 bills on their parents' credit cards. And Facebook did nothing to prevent that from happening and refused to refund it when the parents found out. And then after that, both Google and Facebook were busted by Apple for having these research products, they called them, that circumvented the app store and then spied on the people who used them. Now, they paid them a little bit of money, but what they were doing was so invasive, and many of the people affected were minors, right, under 17 and under. And so this was, I think, unethical, and that kind of behavior is what you get when there's no checks and balances. And I don't think these are bad people. I've never thought they were bad people, but I do think their business practices are bad. Well, let me say, let me just read a couple of lines from your uh, Time Magazine article. It says, on Facebook, information and disinformation look the same. That's what Trump is calling fake news, disinformation. The only difference is that dif disinformation generates more revenue. So fake news right. generates more revenue, so it gets better treatment. Do you still believe in that or support oh, that? Oh, no. That's, it, it, MIT did an amazing study where they demonstrated that disinformation spreads 60% further or 70% further and six times faster than facts. And it actually makes sense because things that appeal to your outrage or fear you want to share with other people because if you're either afraid or outraged, you want other people to share those emotions with you. Whereas if you share something like a wedding photo or some happy thing, not everybody's going to be as excited about that as you are, so it won't spread as virally. And that's just human nature. And what's really interesting was that MIT controlled for the, for the impact of what are known as bots, which are the software robots that do the automatic forwarding of things. And it turns out the bots were indifferent between facts and disinformation. So all of the, all of the impact was from the humans. And that is, that's just how things work. And 
a different set of companies would have said, you know, that's actually a problem. We don't want that to happen, so we're not going to optimize our product for that. But these guys didn't feel any constraints. Nobody ever told them, hey, you shouldn't do that. They basically said, look, we live in a world where you, you, whatever you can get away with, you can do. And so they did. Hey, Kim, Kim, so, what, so Rob, yeah. Kim weren't you upset about that fact that they just kept stirring up people? Yeah, well, that was one of the things that has was one of the trends was that this outrage and fear. And, and what I'm hearing Roger say, and you talk about this, Robert, Roger, is that um, Facebook started gathering data anywhere, but then it started spying on people, even people that weren't using Facebook. It was selling all this data without any user's permission. Um, and basically, so I, I guess you're saying people are basically seen as, a, as you say, a metric, not a person. Yeah. And you're basically well, and, taking and, away their rights of freedom. Yeah, Kim, think of it as a, a, um, a form of eminent domain. They've basically pushed the envelope around data constantly, and they use terms of service that are in way too long to read and completely incomprehensible, so people don't even bother to read them. And their position, and again, it works just like eminent domain would work with land. They basically said, we want this data. It's useful for us. We're going to take it. And if you don't like that, you have to abandon the huge investment you've made in you know, friend networks and all the things in our system. And that's not a that's not a reasonable trade. Like extortion. So extortion. Pe- it, well, it's certainly a bad thing. And the thing I would say is, what they do is legally very clever. They don't actually sell the data directly. What they do is they sell access to it. And it's not just Facebook. Google does this really intensely. And that surveillance, Google's actually the first one to do it. They were the ones who more or less invented this model. And they collect data everywhere. So they go to your cellular phone company, and they get all of your location data. And they get it for absolutely everyone. They go to credit card companies and get all of the credit card data. They go to anyone who will sell data, and they get it to create the most detailed picture of each person they can possibly have. And the reason that makes so much sense is that some of their products, are designed to manipulate whole populations as opposed to individuals. And so you need to know about everybody. And in my mind, that business model is just a really bad idea, uh, particularly sort of appearing out of nowhere. We had no time to adjust, no time to prepare. And what's interesting is after the Russian interference in the 2016 elections, a significant minority of Americans changed their behavior. They stopped getting their political stuff from social media. They stopped getting their news there. They decided to get involved in politics on whatever side they were on. And that, to me, was very encouraging. But you need time to do that. And so we need time across the whole range. And if you think this stuff is bad, the next step that's coming, artificial intelligence and the Internet of Things, which are products like Alexa. You know, you may have seen there was an ad on the Super Bowl that was very popular with Harrison Ford and his dog, and the dog uses Alexa to order dog food by barking. And the thing that people haven't figured out with all these products that are based on Alexa is they listen all the time. So they're gathering data from anybody who happens to be in the room. And they're gathering data on cell phones even when your cell phone isn't turned on. Well, they're gathering whatever right? data they can get. They're, well, I don't yeah. If the cell phone's okay. not turned on, if the app's not turned on, some of the Google things on, on certain phones will gather data even if you're not using the app. But the phone does have to be turned on most of the time. And you, and you have permissions inside the app for location, uh, allowing location access and privacy access. You, I mean, you can you, control you, some of it. You can control some of it, but to be clear, there have been violations of those, right? Yep. There has been involuntary data collection. And when you look at AI, here's the thing. With artificial intelligence, the three biggest use cases you see right now are eliminating white-collar jobs, then what are called filter bubbles, which are essentially these things on social media that influence the things you believe. They basically tell you what to believe. And then thirdly, recommendation Jeez. engines that tell you what products to enjoy or to consume. And if you think about what makes each one of us an individual, our job, the things that we believe, and the things we purchase or enjoy, those are among the most important things that distinguish each one, of, every one of us. So, Roger, that Ro- not, Roger, that's not bicycle for the mind. That's right, that's dangerous. Roger, we, we come back. We're going to how do you protect yourself from the dark side of big tech? And you know, I, I just saw my friend. He's so proud of his Alexa. 
I don't even think he knows he's being listened in on. You know, his wife might have some things to say about that. But anyway, yeah, exactly. for, the, for, the, for the old guys like me, we don't even know what's going on. So stay tuned. We come back. We'll be have Roger McNamee. He's an investor and venture capitalist. We come back. We'll be going more into how do you protect yourself from the dark side. And I think what Roger is saying is, but wait, it's going to get worse. You're listening to The Rich Dad Radio Show with Robert Kiyosaki. What is your number one expense in life? Your number one expense, it's taxes. And I've asked the question is how come there's no financial education in school, but why isn't there education on taxes either? You know, they tell you to save money, which is stupid. They tell you to invest in the stock market, which is stupid. But what they teach you about taxes. So here we have Rich Dad Advisor, Tom Wheelwright, we're talking about his revision for his book, Tax Free Wealth. Welcome, Tom. Thanks, Robert. So what's the tax-free wealth about? What what's different this time? It's a rev revised edition. Well, so what we did was is we ha this is the first major tax reform we've had in 30 years, 2017. Right. Was 86 was the last one. 86 was the last one right. back when I was in Washington D.C. So many guys got wiped out because of that tax change. <laughs> they did. They yeah. did. It wiped out an entire industry, savings and loans. This new tax law is just as big, but in a very different way. It affects different industries. You know, the tax law is always a series of incentives. And the question is always which incentives and which ones apply to me. And so the, the key to revising tax-free wealth was what is it, what changed so much in this new tax law that we can absolutely take advantage of, the I mean, seriously, the amazing incentives. For example, I mean, the bonus depreciation, for example, for real estate is unbelievable. You buy a, a, a million dollar apartment, get a $300,000 reduction or more the very first year. So if you want to make more money and pay less taxes like Donald Trump and myself, get Tom's book, Tax-Free Wealth. Don't be like Charlie. Charlie is that do-it-yourselfer who does himself in. Do-it-yourself is good for tile and grout. It is not good for asset protection. Charlie thought he'd save a few dollars forming his LLC online. With no guidance, he did it wrong. When he sold the property, he lost thousands and thousands of dollars. He did himself in by trying to do it himself. Don't burn yourself. Use Corporate Direct to set up and maintain your LLCs and corporations. Corporate Direct is owned and operated by attorney and rich dad advisor, Garrett Sutton. Garrett wrote the bestsellers, Loopholes of Real Estate and Start Your Own Corporation. He is Robert Kiyosaki's attorney for asset protection. He and his team will do it right. Visit them at CorporateDirect.com or call 800-600-1760. Mention Rich Dad and receive $100 off your formation fee. That's CorporateDirect.com. CorporateDirect.com. Log on to RichDadRadio.com while you listen. Now back to Robert Kiyosaki. Welcome back. Robert Kiyosaki the Rich Dad Radio Show. The good news and bad news today about social media. It's about how there's such fake news and fake new media and fake social media. You know, to me fake social media comes out as antisocial behavior. We use we use things like Facebook and things like that to attack each other, to, to steal from each other. So once again, you can, and our guest today is Roger McNamee, he's an investor, venture capitalist, and musician, one of the early round guys in Facebook. And he's concerned about what Mark and Cheryl, Cheryl Sandberg are doing. So you can listen to the Rich Dad Radio program anytime, anywhere on iTunes or Android, and all of our programs are archived at Rich Dad Radio. We archive it for one reason, Rich Dad is an education company. We have, we don't sell or recommend or say you buy this or sell that, but we want you to listen to it to enhance your awareness of what's going on in the world. So this this program especially is worth listening to again because if you go to richdadradio.com, you pull it up, you listen to it one more time, you'll gain probably 70 to 80% more than just by listening to it one time. And most importantly, if you get together with friends, family, and business associate and listen to this program about Facebook with Roger McNamee, the author of the book Zucked, Z-U-K-E-D, Waking Up to the Facebook Catastrophe, and you discuss it, you'll learn even more. So as we promise, going into the dark side of social media, Shane, and Shane is the president of Rich Dad, any concerns on the dark side? Because you're in that world all the time, the dark side too. Yeah, well, from... From one side of it, obviously, Rich Dad uses it as an advertising platform where, yeah. you know, we 
We, collect we capture data. leads. Yep, we capture data. We read it and analyze it, and then uh, adjust our marketing and our products, you know, to it. So on one side, obviously, we use it right for the for the tool that it is. On the other side, what worries me personally, you referred to just a second ago, and Rogers referred to it, is is the antisocial behavior, and then that tied to the power that they can move masses, and they can control it in any direction they want it to go for their what they want their outcome to be versus whatever either the individual actually wanted or even the power of the people. Right. Uh, on the small picture, I understand there's a lot of bullying going on on social media right now. Yeah, cyberbullying. Yep. Cyberbullying. But also on the bigger picture, I was talking to Roger during the break, he talks about how the lack of, you know, it says, Three basic services brought internet service to poor people in roughly 60 countries. That's got me concerned. Because if you can do it to an individual, it's bullying. We can do it to a whole country. Mm -hmm. And it's about the cost of massive social disruption. Massive social disruption. Lack of language skills and cultural in insensitivity have blinded Facebook to the, to the ways in which it has its platform can be used to harm defenseless minorities. So you know, they may be bullying your kid or the kid may be bullying your kid, somebody else's kid, but we're doing it to whole countries now. And this has already played out deadly incomes in Sri Lanka and Myanmar. And I was just in Myanmar where the Rohingya are. Rohingya are basically Muslim. They've been there for 800 years or 8,000 years. But the Buddhists over there supposedly are attacking them. And for, you know, I'm not Buddhist, but you think a Buddhist is pacifist, but why would they be attacking the Rohingya? Roger, any idea on that? How, how can... Social media. I, I, I do. I, I, go a, a whole country, a whole bunch of people, and murder them. Let me tie this to the thing you just said about advertising. The thing that, that really impresses me, and this is the good side, is that Facebook and Google have created the greatest advertising platforms ever. And almost all advertisers are forced to use them because their targeting is so good. And, you know, I'm using it to help promote Zuck. Why? Because Zuck is a book that's really aimed at people who use Facebook and Instagram and Google. And so I want to be advertising there to get to the people who are interested. But it's really true for all advertisers. And so that conveys great power. When you take that power into a country like Myanmar, where there is no history of telecommunications, where there's no media, so you have people who aren't used to any kind of political engagement at all. Uh, you have to be incredibly careful. And Facebook Free Basics was designed to be to plant a seed in these developing countries. And they wound up signing six signing up business in sixty countries, many of which had never had any previous media or previous telecommunications and that were basically going straight to cell phones. And so their first contact with media was social media. And they had no idea what disinformation was. And what happened was that in some countries, in Myanmar and Sri Lanka are the most glaring examples, basically bad actors were able to spread hate speech that re resulted in the deaths of at least 9,000 people in Myanmar and dozens of people in Sri Lanka. And the citizens of those countries had no way to distinguish between the hate speech and facts. And it was coming from people they trusted. In, in Myanmar, it was coming from the military and from senior members of, of, of Buddhism there. And it produced this horrible outcome that the United Nations characterized as a classic ethnic cleansing, and they attributed it to the presence of Facebook. And so, you know, Facebook didn't cause it, but once again, they enabled it. And the problem here is a lack of cultural sensitivity, a lack of language skills, and a business model that basically says, we're going to ship products as soon as they're available, and we're going to let the people who use the products find the bugs, find the problems, and, you know, it won't be our problem, but we'll try to clean up the mess later. But if you're in Myanmar and you're a member of the Rohingya minority, you could easily be dead without ever using Facebook, right? So mm -hmm. that's that's a situation where the Facebook model not only didn't work, it was catastrophic. And that is a more extreme version of what's going on in Europe and North America. But directionally speaking, these platforms have essentially not accepted responsibility for the consequences of their actions, and it's been a disaster. Did you ever bring that up with uh, Mark or Cheryl? I wish I could have. I didn't. 
I didn't know about what was going on with Free Basics then. The uh, genocide in Myanmar basically took place in 2017, so uh, roughly nine months after I was uh, last in communication with them. So I don't know how they feel about it. What I know is that their response to it was to say this was unfortunate and we haven't been able to hire enough fact checkers in Myanmar. And my response is, hang on just a sec, guys. I mean, even if you had been able to hire enough fact checkers, that's not the right response when there's, you know, at least 9,000 people dead. You, you know, the right response is you got to go in and fix this. And you've got to do something for the families of the people who were killed. And, you know, you, they should be committed to preventing any kind of hate speech around the world. But, again, philosophically, they were trained by the people who first invested in the company and, frankly, by the whole culture that has taken over Silicon Valley over the last decade. They were trained to think that that they could do whatever they wanted and it was somebody else's problem. And that culture has to go. Have Cheryl and Mark fallen into the the trap of you know, Facebook is a publicly traded company. They have to please their investors. They have to have strong earnings and revenues. And, and are they justifying their actions by trying to please investors, which happens so much in corporate America? So I think that, that I think that's a very handy excuse. But let's remember, for both Facebook and Google, their stock is organized in a way that gives the founders absolute control of the company. So if Mark or Larry and Sergey at uh, Google decided that they wanted to save the world now, they could do that. It wouldn't matter what the shareholders think. So I think it's a very convenient thing. My, the thing that I've pleaded with Mark and Cheryl through the press is to recognize that they have been successful beyond their wildest dreams. They've made massive fortunes. And this is an opportunity to do the right thing at the right time for all the people and that Google can do the same thing. Um, so far, that message has not <laughs> taken hold, and maybe that I'm just the wrong messenger. But I think if they engage with the issues, there will be plenty of other messengers who might be more, more acceptable to them. The thing that makes me sad is that the boards of directors of both Facebook and Google have not, as far as I can tell, in any way... Uh, slowed down this kind of behavior yeah. or, uh, you know, created any kind of incentive to behave differently. And that makes me very sad because there are a lot of good people on these boards, but they seem to be, to have been captured and therefore not uh, engaging the way I would hope they would. So, so Roger, with that said, you know, the point here is if, you're, if your child is being bullied on social media, it's not much different than a whole country being bullied or attacked by social media. So the question at the start of this segment is, what can you and I do? What can, in average, what yeah. can our listeners do? So the book has whole chapters on what policymakers do and especially what we as the humans formerly known as users can do. The most important thing to recognize is that these companies depend on our attention. And we don't have to delete the apps to have an impact on them. We should try to recognize that relative to kids, the old model that we had, which was expose kids as early as possible to as much technology as possible, that turns out to be wrong. We've run that experiment, and pediatricians are now saying, you know what, we were wrong about that. You want to have no exposure up to age two, and then from two to 13 or 14, you want to keep it pretty limited. Uh, you don't want phones or computers in the classrooms for most students. What you really want to use is classroom time at school for, uh, for learning how to pay attention, learning how to engage socially with other students and with teachers, and that you use the technology at home and uh, in other settings when you're on your own. You know, my basic belief on this is that all of these things will be a lot easier to do if parents get together, if they recognize that having something like a book club that organizes play dates that have no screens and, you know, have days of the week when there are no screens in the house at all. And parents need to recognize that they set the role model, right? They are the role model and that their behavior will influence the kids. So they want to be super careful about checking their phone all the time around their kids. And there are lots of things you can do. And the point is you don't need to do them all. 
and you can start with a few and then work your way up. I mean, I've done this experiment on myself. I was hopelessly addicted to all this stuff. At one time, I carried, Robert, I carried seven different mobile devices. Jeez. <laughs> and I thought this was all my fault because I didn't realize that they had consciously tried to addict me. And once I realized that, then I realized this was no different than what you've seen with OxyContin and the other opioids where, where you know, there were conscious strategies of exploiting people's pain, right, for corporate gain. And the key thing that is that, you know, you need everybody, we all need help, and we want to get it from our friends and do this stuff together, and it'll be a lot easier that way. But the book is filled with advice on, on how to do this. And, and the most important thing to recognize is that, if you're addicted to social media, your kids are addicted to social media, they are not entirely at fault that this was done to them. And when you go into a McDonald's or something and you see four kids at a table who aren't talking to each other, they're just Mm -hmm. texting, you go, you know, that's probably not healthy. Mm -hmm. And it would be better if they made eye contact and treated each other like human beings to be a lot less bullying and a lot less pain. You know, there was a book years and years ago in my generation that was called Future Shock. And it, oh, I remember it well. Yeah, and he, he talked about high tech would eventually have to get back to high touch because high tech would go too far. And he well, says that, here we are, Robert. <laughs> this sounds like it, here doesn't we are. it? it no, I, I think we really are there. I remember when that book came out as well. And, and you know, the, the truth is we had for 50 years really good reasons to t- trust technology. It always made our lives better. And Google and Facebook have exploited that trust to create business models that don't deserve to be trusted. And it really matters now because with Alexa and things like that coming on the market, you know, we, our tendency is to think, wow, this is a little bit more convenient than what I have now. I'm going to get it without realizing that you're setting yourselves up for much, much worse outcomes and that the little bit of convenience that these things offer is for most people not a good trade-off. I, I, I'll grant you there will always be some people for whom the trade-off is valid, but for most people, no. So let me, one more last question for you because Rich Dad is primarily targeted to entrepreneurs and you know professional investors, small guys. But you have a big emphasis that these big companies are actually crushing the small entrepreneurs. Is oh, they're, cry, they're killing them. And, and here's the thing. I believe the next big thing should be based on the old tech model of bicycles for the mind, technology that enhances people's capability. And I want to have a whole entrepreneurial wave. The problem that we have today is that Facebook and Google have acquired would-be competitors where they want to and crushed the rest. And so as a consequence, they've managed to divert most of the money and most of the entrepreneurship in Silicon Valley to, to businesses that just aren't as attractive as theirs, things like cryptocurrency or, you know, scooters or services your mother used to provide for you. And it's not to say these are bad businesses. It's just that they're very capital intensive and the returns so far have been way lower than returns from the businesses that Facebook and Google are in. And I want to use government regulation, particularly antitrust law, to create space for entrepreneurs to work. And we're going to need cures for all of this stuff. We're going to need to have things with better business models, things that treat you know, the people who use the products is customers, the way Apple does. And Apple's not perfect, but, you know, they at least are trying. And I think that's what every entrepreneur should do now. That's a profound statement. So what advice do you have for small entrepreneurs with hopes and dreams of someday being Facebook or Google? <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, we I all do. don't want to be, please don't want to be Facebook or Google. Please want to be <laughs> Apple. <laughs> Please, please set your targets on Apple or Salesforce.com or, you know, IBM. What, because, is, App, what is Apple doing different? Because, so Apple, because they sell you a phone for $1,000, they treat you as a customer. And to be clear, there are things that they do that I wish they didn't do, particularly in their manufacturing in China. But they are very sincere about protecting the privacy and protecting the security of the people who use their phones. And they, they evicted these applications from Facebook and Google last week. Yeah. that were spying, and they have done things like that in the past. And it, it, right now, in the battle for smartphones, Apple's products are so much more secure and so much better on privacy that it's really worth paying the premium to protect yourself. Wow. And I think Apple is at least setting a good example. They've got a long way to go, but I, I believe they're determined to get there. And the way I look at this is that it's like 
you know, the two guys in the woods when the bear shows up and one guy's putting his sneakers on, and the other guy says, dude, what are you doing? There's a bear coming up. And the guy goes, look, I don't have to outrun the bear. I just need to outrun yeah, you. <laughs> and in this thing, you know, Google's the bear, right? And Apple's basically looking around going, look, I'm not perfect, but I'm going to put my sneakers on because I just need to outrun everybody else. And as a user, you want more of that, okay? You want more people behaving that way, that using – Google's Android operating system to create next generation Internet of Things devices is going to lead to trouble because that operating system is not designed to protect people. It's designed to to do this surveillance uh, technology, and that's that. All of that scares me. And from an entrepreneur's point of view, I think this is a tough time in tech because you know the investors are really scared of competing with Facebook and Google. But knock wood, over the next year or two, we're going to clear some space and. Uh, then you're going to have one of the greatest bull markets ever. I mean, if we can help to solve climate change with solar and wind power, we can for sure solve this problem with, with Bicycles for the Mind. Well, Roger, thank you, thank you, thank you very, very much. I mean, for Hey, it's been a pleasure. Uh, Enjoyed Shane, it enormously. Shane, Shane's the young guy, and I'm the old guy, and I you know, I barely know how to turn on my cell phone. <laughs> Any final comments, you know, that, sir? That, Robert, that's a good act, but I'm not buying it. Ah. <laughs> I, I saw, we I, live with... I saw this Japanese guy the other day on on television. This is the new the new big thing. He's teaching old guys like me how to use technology. <laughs> well, I said I so agree. See, <laughs> I I wrote I wrote this book for people who who don't understand technology. And yeah. the thing is, the industry uses techno babble because they don't want you to understand what's going on. It's right. much simpler than it looks. The people who tell you Congress can't regulate it are missing two points. One is Congress is getting younger every day, and they are citizen legislators. And the second thing is they regulate industries like health care and banking, which are 10 times as complex. So, you know, we'll get our hands around this, but we got to all work on it together. Yeah, I just want to touch on one thing, Roger, you said about um, kids in particular and the antisocial behavior that using technology at too young of an age alters their future. From a person who owns a couple businesses and hires people, um, those effects are already starting to show up on people in their early 20s um, that may or may not be out of college when they go interview for a job and you put them in a social environment because we're hardcore team people here at Rich Dad. And getting them involved and to understand how to debate with a, with a coworker and have a healthy conversation about whatever a marketing strategy should be or a product strategy should be, is getting very, very difficult because just the lack of social skills and the ability to listen and to understand someone else's point of view is making it much harder on an entrepreneur to develop a truly solid team um, and create strong products that have input from many people versus just one brain st- or you know just shoving the thing down your throat. That's precisely my experience. And, you know, what I'm trying to do in this book is to help people deal with that. All right. So, Roger, you know, thank you very, very much for your uh, concern and your speaking out. I think it's timely and needed. So thank you again. Well, thank you, Roger. So, so please, I, ho- I hope everybody will order a copy of Zucked and read it because it's, uh, it's really aimed for you. And uh, I've been an entrepreneur three times, and I've worked with entrepreneurs for 34 years. And, you know, this is my world, and I want right. to make it a better place. Well, I'm going to promote your book, but also your website is called Elevation.com. Well, and yeah, it's, it's actually, if they go to Zucked Book is where you go for, for the book. And Zucked Book. I would appreciate it. Yep, ZuckedBook.com. Yep. Well, that's that's why we at Rich Dad Radio would like to give you as much time to pitch your book or tell your story so people will buy your book. And the reason we endorse it is because it's a timely book. It is probably the most timely book of today. So thank you for your thank contribution. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. And we come back, we'll be going to the most popular part of our program, which is Ask Robert. You're listening to The Rich Dad Radio Show with Robert Kiyosaki. Don't be like Charlie. Charlie is that do-it-yourselfer who does himself in. Do-it-yourself is good for tile and grout. It is not good for asset protection. Charlie thought he'd save a few dollars forming his LLC online. With no guidance, he did it wrong. When he sold the property, he lost thousands and thousands of dollars. He did himself in by trying to do it himself. Don't burn yourself. Use Corporate Direct to set up and maintain your LLCs and corporations. 
Corporate Direct is owned and operated by attorney and rich dad advisor, Garrett Sutton. Garrett wrote the bestsellers, Loopholes of Real Estate and Start Your Own Corporation. He is Robert Kiyosaki's attorney for asset protection. He and his team will do it right. Visit them at CorporateDirect.com or call 800-600-1760. Mention Rich Dad and receive $100 off your formation fee. That's CorporateDirect.com. CorporateDirect.com. It pays to listen. Now back to Robert Kiyosaki and the Rich Dad Radio Show. Welcome back, Robert Kiyosaki, the Rich Dad Radio Show, the good news and bad news about money. And once again, I want to thank Roger McNamee. He is the author of the book, Zucked, Working Up to the Facebook Catastrophe. Please go out and get that book. He said it was written for old guys like me, but I think it's written for all of us, given the world we're in today. It was disturbing to listen to him, wasn't it? Very. The interesting thing is, is it's not that you don't know that that's not happening, but to hear it in his very clear, detailed explanation of how they're doing it and the power that it wields is really eye-opening. Right. And there's another book we've another, another we've had on here was called uh, Coddling of the American Mind. And I forgot the author's name, but he is his also book of the year or something. But he writes about Generation I or I Generation as those born after 1995 because all they know is a cell phone. Mm -hmm. And they're very, very – that's why he says there's such disturbances coming on college campuses and in workplaces and all that because they're different. Just because it's a little iPhone, they're very, very different people. And that's what was disturbing to hear about the Rohingya in Miramar or was Burma. They just slaughter people. They get so – pissed off at everybody and they get so wrapped up and they'll go and kill anybody. There's no difference bullying on social media, right, Shane? Yeah, it's the same thing. It's just on a, on a national... I mean, there's been teenagers and young kids that have committed suicide yeah. over over cyberbullying. So, I'm glad you guys listened to it and um, you can listen to the Rich Dad Radio anytime, anywhere on iTunes or Android and all of our programs are archived at richdadradio.com. Again, we archive them because we're an education company. We make no recommendations except to buy this book. Listen to this program one more time. You'll gain about 70% more and most importantly, get together with friends, family, your kids and business associates. Listen to this program with Roger McNamee, M-C-N-A-M-E-E. -E. The book is Zucked. Listen to this program and discuss it. If you listen to it and discuss it, your retention and knowledge will explode. So, coming to the most po popular part of our program, which is Ask Robert. You can submit your questions to askrobert at richdadradio.com. And by the way, Kim had to leave early. So, Melissa, what's the first question? Yeah, our first question today, Robert, comes from Michael in Scottsdale, Arizona. Favorite book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. With the mainstream effects of social media and AI on our privacy, how do you and Kim protect your personal and business information, and how do we all protect ourselves? Well, that's good because I'm lucky that's how Shane here because I know <laughs> nothing. I, I, I really Kim knows more than me, which is not saying much. <laughs> but that's why we have Shane here and all this. But it's not just personal; it's a company too, right? We've been hacked many time. times, many yep. times. Yep. So Shane, what what do you suggest to that? Well. I guess when you go to protection, I'm going to talk a little bit about what Roger uh, mentioned in his interview, which is the understanding of the power back into the person where you're we're hoping that maybe Facebook or Google would change their business model, which I think is ridiculous. They're not going to. Well, it's too big. No. Yeah. And it's there's too big. There's too much money at play. Yeah. There's just too much money. And and he even he even alluded to it when he said, you know, they've achieved beyond their wildest dreams I, I noticed he said at the end there when we asked him the question about have they fallen into that corporate trap of trying to please investors and, and their stock price. And he said, well, they're not typically set up like most companies where they can control and change their business model, but they haven't. That's the first thing. And the second thing is he also said that the board of directors almost looks away with a blind eye. So, so what, what would you recommend to get people like Kim and myself? So we protect our ways, our, our, our data in a lot of different ways. Obviously, we keep up with encryption software. I don't want to get into too, too, uh, too technical stuff. Um, but we've also moved away from the storing of, of like personal credit card data and things of that nature because we don't want to be responsible for that because that's really what people are trying to hack. So we move that off onto third parties that are just much better 
protection. at that type of at that type of protection. That's number one. Uh, number two, the other thing we do, and this really gets into the the personal development side of Rich Dad, but we also make sure that our staff um, understand the addictive nature of these types of tools, and that the more you use them, the more focus you get away from your true dreams, which are why you read Rich Dad Poor Dad in the first place, which is to become an entrepreneur and become and retire young and live the life you want. So we try to focus on not as an individual not falling into the addictive natures of these apps and these tools so you can stay focused on your life and your dream and pay attention to what's happening around you versus just, you know, uh, holding on to a phone so, but, 24 but hours how, a day. But how do you do that? I mean, how do you instill, how do you pass that on? How does a person like me not get addicted? Not, um, that, well, not that I am. Yeah, but. well, that's what we do. So at Rich Dad, we have a lot of personal development courses and coaching. Right. That that talk people through about hey you can still achieve your dreams but the interesting thing is is Robert is is it's we again we focus on that personal development side but on the other side of there's a balance that these unfortunately these tools are your future you know you can run a business from your phone now right so the question is what kind of controls can you put in place where you can put the phone down and talk to someone or enjoy a TV show or maybe dream for a while. So what we do is we do a lot of personal coaching. We, again, we do a lot of personal development things inside of the Rich Dad team. Um, and we always, always try to stay as up to date as possible in terms of everything from what the hackers are doing and what it is they're looking for, as well as what are people's behaviors and where are they going to make sure we bring awareness to it in our communications to our community, as well as the communications to our staff. Right. And to give Shane credit, we, we practice what we preach here at Rich Dad, is that again, there was this book called, it was by Alvin Toffler, Future Shock. And Alvin Toffler is probably in the 60s or 70s. He said it would go to high high tech would have to go back to high touch. Mm -hmm. And we need to talk to other human beings instead of sitting there texting. You know, we've all seen it. A family sits around the dinner table and they're texting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's that's high tech, not high touch. Yeah. So one of the things, like, for example, we do is, is you notice we stopped that at Rich Dad. We put people, we face eliminated cubicles. We put them face to face and you have to work together. You got to right. put that phone down and actually look at it. Talk them. to somebody. Yeah. Versus... Text. Texting and emailing. Right. You know, you just can't communicate and get a point across by shooting a text. And no, the words aren't enough. Nope. You and also, the... you don't know the state of mind of the person receiving it. Correct. So you don't know how they're going to process and read it and respond. So just think about dinner with the family today. They're sitting around texting each other. That's high tech. The, the one step you can do is put that stupid thing down and talk <laughs> to each other, which might be the hardest thing you can do right now. Yeah. Then you're addicted. So once again, thank you for your questions. You can submit your questions to Ask Robert at richdadradio.com. Once again, thank you to Roger McNamee. His book is Zucked, Waking Up to the Facebook Catastrophe. It's out now. And thank you all for listening to the Rich Dad Radio Show.